Welcome to Chase Oaks. We are so glad that you are here this weekend. We have been in a series called Meltdown, looking at the emotions that can get the best of us in the heat of the moment. And this weekend, we are going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about anger. Please don't get mad at me this weekend because you would prove why we all need this message. Now, you might be tempted to think this weekend, you know what, this is the perfect message for my sister, brother, spouse, boss, but what I really want us to do this weekend is to really look in the mirror and be able to say, you know what, is there something in me that God wants to heal? Now, I want us to know that anger is not a sin, but it is something that we need to control because it can certainly cause us to have Meltdowns. Now, here's what I know just from my travels, just from my experience, just from walking around Dallas, and, and, and I, I've just learned that people, people be angry. I, I'm telling you, I, I done met a lot of angry people. I done met people that are so angry that I call them pre-angry. You ever met a pre-mad person, you know what I'm saying? They're mad before the meeting. You're like, the meeting ain't even started. How you already mad? Like some people, they just carry it with them. And if you don't believe that people are angry, I'm going to give you some places that you can find angry people immediately, okay? Number one, Facebook. Okay, you go on Facebook right now. You go, man, I don't got that many angry people. Just try this out. Uh, just type in, post, uh, who are y'all voting for? And just see what happens, okay? I promise you, you will instantly be a magnet for angry people. Let me tell you where else angry people go. This is where thousands of angry people go every single day for a conference. It's called the DFW Airport, okay? I'm just, especially on a weekend like this where like global IT has shut down. Let me tell you, there's not any more angry people that all get on a metal tube together and expect great things to happen. And then they're like, let's go up in this tornado. I'm like, no, let's take our time, all right? I'd rather live and or walk before I get on this airplane. But they're like, no, I gotta get back. I'm like, I don't think you gotta get back that bad. Wouldn't it be great if you got, were there and, and you know you were alive when you got there? That'd be helpful. Um, somewhere else you can find angry people in case you don't believe me. Um, any sports complex in the DFW Metroplex. Um, the YMCA tells us that it's supposed to be for the kids to just have fun. That's a lie, okay? Uh, parents are out of control. Referees are out of control. And at this point, the message, I'm really talking to myself. I wrote this message for me because I'm out of pocket at my son's games, okay? I'm yelling at my son. I'm yelling at my son's friends. I'm yelling at my son's friends' parents. I'm yelling at the referees. I'm yelling at both coaches. People recognize me from Chase Oaks. They're like, aren't you that guy? I'm like, leave me alone. And it's like, <laughs> it's not good, but we just can lose it over sports. I, I had the wonderful privilege, had, had a couple of really good friends that allowed me to go to the NBA Finals in Dallas and in Boston. Y'all, if you're from Boston, I promise you I'm not trying to say anything to offend you, but Boston as a city is angry, okay? And that's why we lost, because you can't beat that level of anger, okay? Like, you go to a Mavericks game they play Baby Shark during timeouts, okay? Like, Baby Shark in the whole stadium. Do, 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 do. You know, kids are having a good time. Boston kids are getting tattoos outside, okay? Like, this is another level. I mean, I went to the bathroom in the middle of the game, and the guy went off, and he goes, do you know what's happening right now? I'm like, dude, y'all can't use the bathroom in Boston? Like, and I wanted to say, hey, man, there's more important things in life in this game, but then I thought he would have said, no, there's not, okay? Like, I live for this. I'm just like, man, people are angry in Boston, and, and we can all find ourselves having a little bit of that in ourselves. This is what I want you to know about anger. When it comes to anger, there's levels to it. It starts with level one, which is just mild irritation. I don't know if you got anybody in your life. Please don't look at this person, okay? But there are, there are people in our life that have this gift of getting on our last nerves. You know what I mean? Like, there's just a mile, it's like a gnat, you know, like a mosquito, you know what I mean? And, like, and please, don't point at somebody like this. It's you. No, I mean, like, like they just, I mean, it could be your boss, it could be your spouse, it could be a friend, it could be your kids after a long day, that they just do these little things that can just, irk you and just mildly irritate you. And if we're not careful, we can allow 
a mild irritation turn into level two, which is provoked frustration. This is the level where you and I use phrases like, they made me mad. Um, you were completely fine. You were minding your own business. And then they did something. They said something. They posted something. They left their clothes on the floor. They forgot to, to wash the dishes. They did something that provoked your anger. So you went from this peaceful state. They did something. And voila, here you are more angry than you thought you could be. Perhaps uh, for you, it's uh, somebody that, uh, for me, I know that provokes my anger the most are waiters that think that they don't need to write down our order. They just think they can memorize it and they're not going to get the order wrong. And I have a deal with my wife. I go, I bet they get it wrong. Because they're just like, I'm like, how can you remember all of that? And sure enough, they bring back the wrong order. I'm like, we didn't order this. I said this. He's like, oh yeah, I, 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 my bad. I'm like, you're bad. Now I got to wait another 35 minutes for you to cook this thing because you, you see, I got anger issues. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, like when I first started this message, I'm like, I don't have any anger issues, but clearly you're like, you need counseling, okay? So, but if we're not careful, level two can lead to level three, which is personal indignation. Personal indignation is where we snap. You see, at level two, whenever you find yourself provoked, you can't get to a place where you go, man, somebody got my order wrong, but okay, we're fine. Like, really, first world problems, we'll get over it. But then there are some people where it, it, they feel indicted. They take personal offense to what was provoked. And they just lose it. And perhaps they say things that they wish that they could get back. But then there's what I would call level four anger. Of a force, uncontrolled rage. You see, all of us have these unspoken rules and preferences that sometimes people don't abide by. And then sometimes we lose it to a place where it's out of control. It's truly a meltdown. I would say that we all get angry, but I wouldn't say that we all throw coffee mugs or that we all punch holes in walls, or that we all cuss someone out to the point of severing the relationship all together. Oh, I realize that for some of us that this message could actually be triggering because this message isn't based on a true story for you. It's a daily reality for you. You actually might find yourself working for, being married to, living with what you would call a monster. And my prayer for us this weekend is that we would go to a heavenly father and say, would you deal with the monster in us? Would you deal with the monster in me? Would you help me look deep inside of my heart, deep inside of my soul and say, Lord, is there something that I'm taking out on other people that I really should have been taking to you? And so I want us to consider th three things this weekend with our anger. Three things that I think is going to add tremendous value to our lives. Uh, the first thing that I want us to consider is to be honest about where we are with anger. To be honest about it. it we can't change something we're not willing to be honest about. Uh, when we begin to look at all levels, when we begin to look at mild irritation, when we begin to look at provoked frustration, when we look at personal indignation, when we look at uncontrolled rage, where are you? Where are we? When it comes to anger, we have to be honest about it. I love what 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you've, you failed the test. I think it takes great maturity for us as believers to be the kinds of people that say, you know what, I, I want to... I want to look within. I want God to be able to search my heart and really, really consider, Lord, is there, is there something in me that you truly want to heal? And whenever I, I talk about anger to, to especially friends that are Christians, you know, that, well, they say, hey, uh, well, you know, 
you know what the Bible says. It says, you know, Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And so that someone people say to me, well, Ryan, you know, that anger is not a, is not a sin. And I go, 100%. I, I agree with you. But when you're talking about anger, it, it's not about is it a sin, but it's about what anger can lead to. That is a sin. You see, it can lead to us getting to a place where we're actually harming other people with our words. And sometimes the world around us becomes our punching bag. Uh, I love the, some other Christians that I'll talk to you about anger. They'll say, well, Ryan, you know that there's this thing called righteous anger, which I kind of agree. But I would just ask you to look it up in the Bible. I want you to go to BibleGateway.com. I want you to type in righteous anger. I'll wait. We'll see what pops up. Nothing. You'll find the words righteous and anger maybe in the same paragraph three to five times depending on the translation you look up. But you'll never find them actually together. What you will find is that, that there is some anger for some good things. Perhaps you go, Jesus flipped some tables which would go viral in 2024, we know. So yes, is there such a thing as a good kind of anger and a bad kind of anger? Absolutely. It's just that all of us think that our anger is the good kind. We all think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm angry, but I have the right to be angry. I've got the legit kind. I've got the righteous kind. I've never met anybody that goes, yeah, I got the bad anger. Yeah, that's me. And so while it exists, I, I'm just going to go first. I think, no, the, a lot of times the internal or external anger that I may exhibit, I, I've got to take that to God to go, you know, something doesn't seem right. I, I love what Ephesians 4, 26 says. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry. But verse 27 says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, this is interesting. Because now we're going, well, is it a sin? Well, let's move the conversation. Let me, ask this, let me ask us all this this weekend. Is it a foothold in your life? Do you have anger? Or does anger have you? What's the difference? The, the difference is being mad at somebody or being mad at everybody. Getting mad at something or being mad at everything. You ever met somebody that was mad at the world? I'll never forget sitting across the lunch from a friend. And we were talking about a mutual friend. And my friend starts going off about our mutual friend. <laughs> starts barking about him. I'm like, oh man, let me change the subject. You know, let me pick somebody else. So I picked a different mutual friend. I thought maybe this would cheer him up. He starts going off about that second mutual friend. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay, you know what? Let me, let me find a third person. Maybe this person's like Mother Teresa. I'm like, there's no way he would have anything negative to say about this person. And he starts going off about the third person. And at that point, I just gave up. I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to enjoy my chicken Caesar salad. Like, I don't know what else to say anymore. I'm, I'm at loss for words. And he could see it on my face. He felt the pause in our lunch. And he said, Ryan, I guess I'm mad at everybody, right? I said, maybe. I'm just trying to figure out what we all did to you. So I think all of us have to step back and go, does anger have me or do I? Have anger. The second thing that I want us to consider this weekend, I think it's going to help us all, is I want us to consider extending the fuse on what gets us angry. Extending the fuse. I, I just think that some of us, we've got a very, very short fuse. It does not take much for us to get angry. You know, I, I, what I love about the Bible as it talks about anger is it's not so much about is it a sin or is it not. But what the Bible does clearly talk about as it pertains to anger is the speed in which we get there. I love what 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Proverbs 19 verse 11 says, good sense makes one 
slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. You know, I've, my concern with some of our anger isn't that we get angry. It's how fast we get there. It doesn't take much. I mean, there's just some people. You got any friends that are, you're just always on strike two with? You know, you're like, hey, like, how are, how are we already here? And it's like you can trigger them in just a moment. I just have to wonder what it would look like for you and I to take a step back and go, could I extend the fuse with how fast I get here? The interesting thing about the things that we get angry about is in hindsight, we're not nearly as mad. In hindsight, it's actually somewhat humorous, uh, especially for every married couple here. I want you to think about your first marriage fight, right? Your first marriage fight, you're like, what? I some of you can't even remember that. Some of you can't remember pre-kid fights. You're like, I don't even remember life then. But like, like I, I remember one of me and my wife's first fights was about a blanket. Okay, it was a blanket. And I said, hey, babe, can you help me with this black comforter? Can you help me fold it? She goes, well, first off, um, it's not black. It's blue. And I thought, I married a colorblind person. What am I going to do? I don't know how to handle this. This, is, this. this could be a deal breaker. I might have to get an annulment because she can't see. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, it's clearly black. She goes, no, it's clearly blue. Amanda, I love you. However, this blanket is black. And so we had to literally FaceTime somebody to be a mediator between us to say, what color is this comforter? And they're just looking at us like, is the, are you guys actually fighting right now? We're like, yes, we are. I need, I need an answer. They're like, well, you're both blind. I see gray. I'm like, no, you must pick one. <laughs> and of course, we can look back now and go, what, what in the world? What, like, what were, we, what were we so angry about? I just have to wonder, is there anything you're livid about right now that five, ten years from now, you'll go, what? Really? The, the other thing I've learned about anger is that um, I've got a lot of stoic friends that um, are somewhat emotionless. Uh, it, they, they lack expression. There's just, a very, there's just a very solemn serenity thing about them that's just like, oh, so that's how you feel. Okay. Like, like they have the counselor posture, but they like work at Walgreens. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, there's not like, what were you, like it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? But... I love those people because it, it, it puts it in perspective. Because you can say what you say in anger, but they repeat it back in peace. And so you're like, I can't believe they didn't text me back. And they say, you can't believe they didn't text you back. You're like, it doesn't sound nearly as bad when you say it. <laughs> can you believe they didn't want to have sex with me last night? They're, I mean, we're married. You mean... You're, you're married. You sound married. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, somebody's tired. You, maybe you're tired next time. I mean, yeah. Like, like they just bring it down a whole nother level. Like, and then my cell phone died. What are you, 12? Calm down. You know, it's like, when it's repeated back to us, somehow we kind of take a step back and go, you know what, actually it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sound third world problem like I make it sound sometimes. It's actually closer to a, a first world problem. Sometimes they say, eh, my in-laws didn't even say thank you. You're like, and your in-laws didn't say thank you. Did you need one to be generous? And, and all of a sudden you're just like, I don't know if my anger matches the crime. Perhaps my anger isn't a reaction. Perhaps we've all been guilty of having an over-reaction. I think when it comes to theological subjects, people can get mad fast. When it comes to political subjects, people can get mad fast. I'm not saying that there aren't some things that we should be angry about, but my concern is the speed in which we get there. I just have to wonder, what it would it look like for you? What it would it look like for me? To get on Facebook, 
to go to the airport, to go to our kids' games. And in our minds and in our hearts, we're just slow to anger. It should take a lot for us to get there. Just imagine if you and I just decided to walk into work and we said, you know what, today there's a lot of people here that have been gifted with this mild irritation and then they provoke me and the next thing I know, I've got personal indignation and who knows, I might just lose it. But imagine if you just walked into work and you said, you know what, I actually know what they're going to do ahead of time. They're going to hit reply all. They shouldn't have done that. I know, but I know. I'm prepared. I'm prepared for it. The person that's going to have an attitude, that's not a new attitude. They've had that attitude for a very, very long time. So why are you so shocked that they're having the attitude? So for you, you be the bigger person and go, what if they never change? What if I do? What if I just said, you know what? I'm going to extend the fuse. I, I, I might be angry, but I'm going to wait for it to happen on Thursday. I'm not going to let them get me on Monday. No, I'm going to be slow, slow burn, you know. Some of us got this microwave popcorn anger. I'm more pot roast anger is what I'm hoping that we all can have. Because some of us, we have such a short fuse and then we go on an anger tour. Monday, we're mad at somebody at work. Tuesday, we're mad at somebody at home. Wednesday, we're mad at somebody on the internet that we never actually stop to look in the mirror and go, why am I actually even mad at all? Imagine what it would look like for you and me to be the kinds of people that say, you know what? There's going to be a lot of things in this world that make me mad. I just want it to happen very, very slow. The third thing that I want us to consider, doing with our anger, whatever level we find it at, is to take our anger to the right places. My concern is that we will often take out on someone else our anger instead of actually pausing long enough to consider where is it that our anger is actually coming from. I think anger is like a warning light on a car. There's something else going on underneath the hood. And you might need to pull over. You might need to go see someone. I think some healthy places to take our anger. Um, number one could be a good therapist. A good counselor. That's a healthy place to take it. Because you don't want something going on at work and you're taking it out on everybody you live with. And you don't want something that's going on at home and you take it out on everybody you work with. Those are unhealthy directions as to where we can take our anger. But I, I absolutely love going to counseling. I love sitting with my therapist. Um, I have lots of things going on in my life, in business, in career. I have a new book coming out in March and, and writing books and publishing books and marketing books and writing books. It can be a very, very frustrating, dare I say, I have been provoked in the last month. But to be able to sit down with a trained professional that can go, hey, how's your soul? How's your emotional health? How's your mental health? And to be able to process that and not make the rest of the world, or dare I say, my home, a punching bag. We don't want to find ourselves in a place where our kids are always on strike two. Sometimes the rules that we put on our kids are we're punishing them for every moment of disobedience they've ever had in their entire life in their one misstep from complete rage. It's just unfair. How are they supposed to keep those tabs at the ages that they are? I think for you and I, we've got to step back and go, I want to deal with my anger and actually deal with what the child actually did today. But I don't want to be taking out on my children some of the angst I have with my parents. It's not fair. They weren't there when you were born. They weren't there when you were raised. I know I have this thought all the time. Y'all ought to be grateful. I didn't have this growing up. <laughs> and they're like, 
I was born in St. Louis, grew up in Rockford, Illinois. They're like, we live in McKinney. What do you want from us? Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, we're supposed to fly to St. Louis to realize how you grew up? Like, how, how are they supposed to, to get any context from that at all? I mean, I think it's, it, it's important for us to take a step back and go, am I taking this to a healthy place? A good friend, a good counselor, a good pastor, It's a great place to start, but can I tell you, there's nobody like Jesus to take your worries and take your pain and go to him. Because uh, just so you know, he's got a really great track record of dealing with angry people. In fact, one of them was one of his disciples. His name's Peter. It's one of my favorite characters. Uh, If you don't know anything about Peter, he's like Jesus' right-hand man. There's only two people in history to ever walk on water, Jesus and Peter. Yet there comes a moment in Jesus' life where he's getting arrested, and the real Peter begins to come out. I love what Luke chapter 22, verse 49 says. It says, when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them, we don't know who at this point, one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. If you're only reading Luke, you're going, man, somebody's out of pocket. Somebody lost it. But then if, if you read John 18.10, it says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. Luke's like, we don't know who it is. John's like, it was Peter. Luke trying to cover for him. I'm not covering. I'm going to let you know it was Peter. It wasn't me. I'm going to tell you who it was. It was not me. It was Peter. <laughs> and then let me just tell you why I love this. It's like, dude, you're the right hand of Jesus. You're supposed to have this like love your enemies thing down pat. You're supposed to be the one that's turning the other cheek. But Peter, you keep a dagger on you just in case something pop off. You know what I mean? Like, like I, love, I love that Peter's like, I'm saved, but barely. You know what I mean? Like, I'm saved, but I still cut you. You know what I mean? Like, he's like the most relatable disciple. Like, if you're here, you're like, dude, I'm not that Christian. You're like, dude, you should join the club. Like, like these dudes you would think spent three and a half years with Jesus, like, like he's, he's good. It's like, no, he's still got a little thug in him from the old days. <laughs> and here's the cool part. Here's what, here's, what, here's what Jesus does. Jesus does what Jesus always does. Luke 22, verse 51, it says, but Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Isn't it amazing? That you can walk on water one day and be ready to cut off a man's ear the next. Isn't it amazing that you can be singing holy forever on a weekend and be ready to cuss out your colleague on Monday? (laughs) But here's Jesus cleaning up his mess. Because that's what Jesus does. He comes alongside us and says, hey, 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 calm down. And he picks up the ear and goes, Let's put the dagger away. I got you, Peter. I get it. I just have to wonder who's here today that needs some time with Jesus. I just have to wonder today who's here today with a broken heart with so much pain and so much pent-up tension and angst and you've been taking it out on the world around you. What I want you to know this weekend is there's a better option. And his name is Jesus. I have to wonder what it would look like for you and I to be the kinds of people that say, Lord, I know I can see anger all around me and other people, but Lord, would you search my heart? And if there's something impure, if there's something out of pocket, if there's something that could cause a meltdown in my life, would you heal the part of me that hurts the most? And may I not be the person that takes out my anger on the world around me. May I be the kind of person that brings my anger to the only person who can heal it, and that's you, my Lord. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing church. I pray, God, that you would help us be the kinds of people that don't allow anger to be in charge of our life. I pray that your peace would be in charge of our life. I pray that your joy would be in charge of our life. I pray that we would not give anger a foothold in 
our marriage, in our relationships, in the way that we parent, in the way that we lead, in the way that we work with one another. May we be the kinds of people that truly have a short fuse. I pray for my friends today that they would truly be slow to anger. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen.